King. My name is Gabrielle Harvey. I am a member of the Real Advantage Committee who is hosting today's um, Crave series on the future of work. In my day job, I am a portfolio services broker at JLL, and we are excited to talk to you about uh, how JLL is looking at the future of work. So uh, first off, before we kick off, we want to talk about some of the upcoming Crave webinars. There's some great ones coming up. Um, there's another one on future of work that has a lot more of an end user focus. Uh, obviously diversity and inclusion, uh, very important uh, in today, for today in real estate. And then I must uh, announce that we have the annual meeting coming up in March. Um, so join the conversation. If there's anything you like today that you wanna post on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, please do, and if you have any special requests, um, please reach out to Steve Smith uh, at, of Northstar, and you can find his email below. Um, we wanna thank our corporate partners, um, all listed here on this slide, as well as our platinum sponsors. Um, without the corporate partners and platinum sponsors, we wouldn't be able to do this. And we also wanna thank our gold and silver sponsors. So today, uh, while Julia is speaking, we want to keep this as interactive as possible via uh, Zoom. So please submit questions and answers uh, as we are going along. I will be monitoring the questions and answers, and I'll be stopping Julia to ask them um, throughout the presentation. You can submit a question by uh, clicking on the bottom of uh, where it says Q&A. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce Julia Georgiulis. I have the pleasure of working with Julia. She is the Director of Research for New England. Um, she is uniquely positioned in our research team because she previously sat in San Francisco and had more of a technology focus. So I have really enjoyed working with her because she understands the data and she has the data focus, but uh, she's also more holistic and she will help us when we have questions that maybe we don't have the data. So she helps us find the data uh, and frame the discussion. So I'll pass it off to Julia. Thanks, Gabrielle. And thank you everybody for having me today. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation. And as we're, as I'm chatting through this with all of you, as Gabrielle showed you, there's a, a question function um, that you can feel free to take advantage of I'm happy to make this conversational. If you have questions uh, as I'm going through the presentation, please feel free to ask them or we can take them at the end. Um, so no, <laughs> I, I'm probably you know the millionth person to have said this um, since the start of the year, but last year truly was unprecedented and you know really highlighted um, areas of challenge, areas of resilience and areas of opportunity for us to be thinking about. And as we go through the presentation, you know, a lot of the trends that I'll be sharing with you are trends that we were actually seeing before the pandemic began. And I mentioned that because the pandemic has really accelerated some of those trends and highlighted some of the challenges, um, you know, that economies or cities or communities or um, different industries faced potentially in, in the face of a, an economic downturn. So as we're talking through this, I'd, I'd like you to keep that kind of in the back of your head that um, you know the pandemic will have brought on some change. There's no question about that. And, and we all hope for the better, but some of it was already in, in play. And I think that that's an important um, message for everybody. Before I get into what the future of work looks like, I think it's really important to frame it in the context of what is the office market performance and the economy looking like, um, because that's really informing how things are starting to change either now or in the future. And just to give you a quick snapshot of the economic impact on the employment sector, this is the US employment chart. You can see we've tracked um, all of the previous four recessions um, alongside the COVID-19 recession that we're all experiencing today. And you can see significant differences between the previous four and the current one. And this is a, a US perspective, but I can tell you that if you look across, um, you know, every major metro area, Boston metro area included, the chart looks the same. So I highlight this to show, you know, the, the experience that um, many of our economies locally are facing is the same one. 
where we've seen the biggest impact those in leisure, hospitality, retail services. Office using sectors have been um, relatively resilient when you compare it to the great financial crisis that was really you know, most heavily impacted with banking, finance, legal services firms. As we start to uh, plan for 2021, looking ahead and, and really, you know, putting some plans in place to bring us back to, um, you know, regular life, we have taken a look at the um, occupancy forecast of what we anticipate that to look like over the course of the year. And if you look at where we're at currently, um, this is pretty consistent. If you look across every major metro area, we're about 20% occupancy levels. It's a little bit higher in some geographies and a little bit lower in others, but that's the average. And as we start to see the vaccine rollout um, and be made available to more and more people over the course of the year, you can see we're also anticipating that occupancy levels will start to increase. And by you know, this time next year, we get to what we're calling our new in office occupancy rate, which is lower than pre COVID levels, because we anticipate there will be some level of um, more permanent work from home. Um, but we do anticipate that there will be a, a great recovery of people going back into the office. One of the impacts that we've seen over the past 12 months has really been significant on the sublease market. You've probably seen lots of headlines of companies shedding space and, and maybe have experienced this yourselves. Um, when we compare it to pre-COVID rates, you can see Boston um, is experiencing a higher level of sublease availability currently. It's not the highest if you compare it to other gateway and like markets. Um, and you know a lot of that was initially wrought by the um, impacts of government mandated closures and how that impacted certain sectors. Um, you know, as companies have progressed through this crisis, they're making a variety of decisions of, of how they want to work in the future. Um, and some, some of the sublease space may not stay on the market, some may come off and, and as a part of an economic recession, you know, we, we've seen this in past cycles where companies go through a portfolio analysis and determine how much space they need um, and where. The other impact that we're seeing on the office market is just a significant decline in leasing activity. You can see um, compared to previous years in the, over the course of 2020, we're about half the level of leasing activity. So I mentioned this because as we get into more of the future of work and what companies um, may or may not be doing, a lot of this is, is still um, to be determined because there hasn't been a lot of real estate transaction volume um, to speak of where we do see the activity is still among the, the core office using sectors um, with one, one you know, change in particular, uh, co-working in 2018 and 2019 was a significant driver of leasing activity. And just by way of this crisis, we've seen that drop significantly, but finance, tech, and legal services, you know, remain the biggest drivers um, in total, you know, almost 50% of leasing activity. The other trend that we've noticed over the course of the past 12 months is that renewal activity has increased. So while we've got a 50% decline in total leasing activity, uh, a significant increase in companies that are renewing in place. And they're doing so for shorter lease terms, meaning that they're thinking about how do we get through this current crisis and potentially delay bigger decisions um, until we have more information post vaccine, post pandemic. What we've started to see um, in recent months actually is more of a recognition that flexibility is going to remain important. We've seen lease terms on renewals um, indicate a more flexible outlook in terms of how long tenants are willing to commit to space. We're also seeing through surveys that we've been conducting that um, there's a potential increase in flexible uh, office space needs in the future as companies are working through what their more long-term, uh, long-range portfolio plans will look like. And there's actually a great opportunity for um, flexible space as companies emerge and, and start to plan in earnest for what they need in the future. 
one of the um, kind of notable headlines that we have been addressing over the last several months, and you're probably familiar with a lot of the headlines that you see on this page here, is this idea of a distributed workforce and who's distributing their workforce, where are they moving to, why are they moving? And you can see a handful of examples here, where, which I should mention are not all a result um, or during the time of COVID. Um, some of them were um, shifts or um, expansions pre-COVID. And you can see that there's a bit of a trend into Sunbelt markets, uh, lower cost markets. Uh, some of them have greater accessibility, a higher quality of lifestyle, different weather. Um, but when you start to break down the headlines, I think this is important. The media could lead you to believe, and I think the, the kind of trend of fear of missing out, you know, like looking on your social media and seeing everybody's on vacation, but not you, you might be led to believe that everybody's contemplating um, a relocation to a warmer locale. When you start to pull apart the headlines, um, some interesting realizations emerge. In the case of New York, since that's more local to us here in New England, uh, the trend of financial services firms distributing their workforce or opening new locations and in, in different markets is actually not a new one. And we've charted it back over the course of the past decade. What's interesting in um, August of 2019, so, you know, roughly eight or nine months before the pandemic really began for us in the United States, there was an article with a headline um, on Fox Business News, financial services firms fleeing New York to Florida. So again, I, I mentioned that because some of the trends that were already in play have continued over the course of this pandemic. If you go to the West Coast and you look at what's happening with, with technology companies, um, I moves to Texas, what is maybe not as predominant in the headline is that they're still keeping a, a Bay Area presence for innovation. I think that's a great comparison for us in the New England region because we are a new, uh, a very kind of new wave innovation hub as you all know and understand. Um, and companies are really focused on our market for that highly expert talent in innovation and technology and life sciences. Um, Julia, before you go on, we do have a question that came in. So um, it's regarding slide three. So it's more about the return to work. And so we say that in December of 2021, we believe 80% of the uh, work will be, or employees will be back with 20% working remotely. Uh, is this driven by the anticipation of the vaccine distribution and herd immunity? How is this uh, to correspond with the notion of hybrid workforce? Yes. That is a great question, and I will dig into hybrid workforce, which I know is an, an important topic uh, in just a couple of slides. And if you still have a follow-up question after we talk about what the hybrid workforce looks like, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, but yes, this is a, a confluence of um, understanding what some of our corporate clients are planning for. You'll see we've got um, a lot of survey information on re-entry timelines. So it might be helpful if I, I move over to that section in just a minute and we'll talk through those dynamics because they're very interesting right now. The last point that I'll make on leasing activity um, over the course of the past 12 months is although we've seen a decline in overall leasing activity and we've seen an increase in renewal activity, we have noted that um, there is a, a trend toward thinking longer term, so separating that this current crisis of what we're all living through and, and getting through vaccination or herd immunity or kids getting back into school even, which is a big challenge for a lot of people. Um, there are companies that are thinking longer term about what they need in terms of real estate and location. And you can see examples of um, leases that were signed over the past 12 months in new developments. And you can see net absorption over the past 10 years has really favored new product. And I'll share what that looks like in terms of how employees that we've been serving are thinking about the amenities that they would like to see and the workplace experience that they would like to see moving forward. So shifting gears now a little bit to the future of work topic, um, I'd like to share with you 
some of our survey findings. And don't worry, I, I'm going to walk you through each one of these questions uh, in detail. So with the first question, what percentage of your workforce is currently back in the office? Almost 60% of our respondents, you can see this is almost 400 um, different corporate responses. Almost 60% said that less than 20% of their workforce is back in the office. And about 22% said 20 to 40% of their workforce is back in the office. Some of this has to do with government mandates. Boston is currently at 40% occupancy cap, as you all are aware of. Um, but that largely trends with that re-entry timeline that you saw on slide three. When do you expect to have at least 50% of the workforce back in the office? Again, this trends with that uh, re-entry timeline that I shared earlier, 32% um, sometime in the first half of this year, 42% in the second half or even later. Um, so, you know, kind of that progression of, of companies and some of the companies that have indicated more conservative re-entry timelines um, are also, you know, some of the companies that have been leasing space and new developments, which I think is interesting. Post COVID-19, what percentage of employees does your organization expect will work in a hybrid model of working both in the office and from home, excluding those that would be permanent work from home? You can see here, 34% are still undecided. And then it's a wide variety of um, responses where you know less than 20% anticipate greater than 50% of their employees. And then it declines from there into a variety of, of responses. And I point that out because the hybrid conversation, which we'll get into, is not necessarily a new standard schedule of if you're hybrid, you're working three days per week in the office and two days per week from home or some sort of combination similar to that. Uh, post COVID, move the faces, what percentage of employees do you expect to work from home on a permanent basis? Again, 36% of our respondents are undecided. And again, another wide variety of um, what, what employers are anticipating in the future. Almost 20% are saying that less than 10% of their employee base will work from home on a permanent basis. Now, this question is an interesting one because this one has actually changed since we first asked it back in April and May of 2020. Um, are you actively planning permanent workplace or office space design changes? When we asked this question in the spring last year, our respondents came back with 90% no, we do not plan to to change our space design. I think as we've learned more about social distancing and health and well-being and um, air quality and how, how germs may spread, we've seen that shift. And you can see now it's 50-50%. And that's going to be driven largely by what type of workplace employers had offered pre-pandemic. Um, a lot of the trends that we're seeing in workplace design now are actually starting to be implemented over the past two years. Post COVID-19, how do you anticipate office workplace density will change? You can see here, this is a pretty overwhelming response that the workplace will be less dense in the future. Again, over the past couple of years, we had started to see companies move toward a de-densification strategy um, from lessons learned over you know, Uber densifying workspace um, in the name of collaboration. So, you know, that trend we think will will be longer lasting now that we've had a year of learnings around health and well-being. What is your 2021 corporate real estate budget expectation? 30% have not yet discussed it. 27% expect it to be 20% up to 20% less in the future. And that really tracks with how we've seen companies behave in previous recessions, really focused on financial and cost management. And then lastly, due to COVID-19, are you planning to change geographic footprint as a part of a more distributed model or portfolio location shift? So you saw the map with all the football plays of companies across the country. Um, and again, you know, trying to separate the headlines from what companies are actually doing, 11% only have said yes. And it's important to note that within that 11%, it's not necessarily moving from one state to another, it could be um, an urban or suburban strategy. 
and I'll, I'll share a little bit more about that. 41%, however, are still undecided. And you can see, you know, there's, there remains a lot of indecision or, or um, to be determined answers as people are really trying to understand what will the vaccine rollout look like? When will kids get back to school? That has been one of, outside of the vaccine, that has been one of the biggest challenges for employers or parents at home juggling a lot of different responsibilities. Um, so part of that reentry timeline that you saw in slide three also corresponds with when kids theoretically will be back to school in person. I have a friend in LA and her kids have not been in school since March of 2020. So you can understand how some of those corporate decisions have been really driven by um, work life needs. Getting into the hybrid workplace discussion. So you saw there was a variety of responses of percentages of people who would be um, working from home or working from office. And it really is a spectrum. And as we've been paying attention to um, the headlines of, of corporations and how they're thinking about it and expecting the future to look for their companies, it is a wide range. And it's also important to note that even, you know, companies that have come out and said, you know, we plan to offer much more of a remote um, workplace option, it doesn't mean that the office will go away entirely. And I think that that's an important key takeaway that, you know, there's still a need for a place to come together. Um, and there are some companies, maybe recently you saw um, uh, PTC coming out saying, you know, work from home is hard. And what we're starting to see now after almost 12 months of working from home is a, a blur of work-life balance um, boundaries. We've seen working hours expand. We've seen um, just the stress of juggling a lot of different stressors that are not part of everyday normal life after a pandemic or before it um, really kind of weighing heavily on, on employees. So there's still a lot to be learned as we get through the pandemic from additional surveys that we've conducted as we have been um, talking with employees, the hybrid future that we are tracking um, based on data is that 74% of employees want an office option. You can see here that roughly 24% of the people that we've surveyed want exclusively in the office and 26% want exclusively outside of the office, but within that, it doesn't mean that they necessarily want to work full time at home. Only 9% have said that they want to work exclusively at home and 16% would like options outside of the office um, and potentially outside of their home. So when you think about that in the hybrid workplace ecosystem, um, there are a lot of different options. And before I dig into these, it's interesting because this one in particular, the third place had emerged over the past couple of years. You probably remember that term of a third place to work. It's not your home and it's not your office. It's that third place that could be your office lobby or your office amenities center or Starbucks or a co-working location. Um, what we have found in surveys uh, conducted in 2016 and 2017, the top two um, benefits that employees saw in their workplace were autonomy and choice. Autonomy has implications for management style as well, but when you combine that with choice and you say you have the autonomy to make the choice of where you can do your best work, that was really appealing to employees even five years ago. So I highlight that because this hybrid workplace ecosystem is not necessarily new, but it's now um, recognized as having benefits for employees and maybe putting a, a little bit more structure and parameters around what that can look like and how we can support employees in a hybrid model. So the options are quite varied. You can work at partner offices or co-working locations. This one in particular for people who live far away from their home office that don't necessarily wanna work from home all the time but need another location, this is a great option. Client sites, third place as I mentioned, satellite offices, if you're looking at an urban or suburban bifurcated strategy, your home, of course, um, meeting, virtual meeting options like what we're doing right now, conference centers, 
uh, which had emerged over the past couple of years. And hotels are actually creating, inviting workplaces uh, to bring people even not staying in the hotel in there and, and create an experience for people to take advantage of. Uh, what's interesting when you think about this is many of you probably on the phone worked at a hybrid schedule pre-COVID. Um, I know I certainly did. I traveled a lot for work and on an average week, I was probably only in the office three days per week. Um, on the days that I was not traveling, sometimes I had meetings in suburban locations and it was easier for me from Natick to stay at home in the morning and go to my afternoon suburban meeting than it was to go to downtown Boston and then back out to the suburbs. So there was a lot of hybrid working, I think, taking place um, over the past decade. And now it's just putting a little bit more of a formal program in place. Julia, before we go on, we had a question on this slide. Um, they wanted to know if these numbers have changed uh, from the last three to six months or if we have that data point. I know you said on the last slide they had changed throughout the pandemic. Yes, so great question. Um, when we were conducting this survey earlier, we actually gave options of how many days per week would you like to be in the office? So it's not quite apples to apples, but what we found was that um, similar to the 75%, which has actually stayed consistent, it was a range of 75% of employees wanting to be either in the office five days a week or three or more days per week or two or more days per week. Um, but you could see there, it, the two or more days per week or even three or more days per week still builds in a little bit more flexibility than um, having a set schedule. And that, that goes back to determining where can you do your best work on any given day, depending on what you need to get done that day. And then one other follow-up question, I think you just answered it with the third um, party place, but they were asking, what is the 1% third party place on slide 13? How is it different from the 16% outside the office or at home or other locations? Yes, so the 1% the third party places is more of like your, your Starbucks. Um, you're not going to have access to all the same amenities if you are going to a co-working location where you could use a printer or a conference room or a client site or even hotels now have equipped um, some great locations. I, I toured the Citizen M in North Station last year and they've got some great co-working amenities and a cafe. And um, so that's really kind of your less, less formal workplace. Great, thanks, Julia. So in addition to understanding, um, you know, what people would like their schedules to look like, we have also been asking why, what is the value proposition of your office and your workplace? And what do you miss most about coming to the office? And this is funny, you know, we're talking about the four C's here, collaboration, creation, career and culture. That's really specific to what people are recognizing is the a great value of having a place to come together. We've been working from home, we've been isolating or quarantining, and people are, are recognizing that we're social by nature and we're really missing that opportunity to come together. So that's really identified and, and kind of reinforced the value of a workplace. Um, when we were coming out of the great financial crisis and this wasn't a topic of conversation, we we're actually framing it around the three C's, cost. Um, I mentioned cost uh, management and reduction last time around, competition, um, who's competing for the choices that you have available uh, and choice. And now we're, we're thinking really much more in a people-centric manner, um, not necessarily about financial cost management, which is definitely important, but what, what do our employees need that help enable their best work and, and therefore, you know, create better productivity and, and company performance. And that really comes down to being able to collaborate with people, socializing, especially for, for people just out of college, moving to a new city. A lot of times the workplace is where they develop their, their great friendships. And that's true for all age groups as well. And then supporting the work of others that, especially for younger employees, learning and developing skills in their career and getting either peer-to-peer -peer support, um, manager support, or even mentor support is critical and, and important to those people. So 
So what does that mean then for the design of the workplace? Um, you've got a variety of different work schedules potentially and, and um, you know, we've learned that people really wanna come, come together to collaborate in the office. So if you think about what the historical office space allocation looked like, um, it was really focused on the individual employee you know, so it was still people focused, but on individual workspaces, you had a cube, you had an office, maybe you sat at an open bench desk, um, maybe you didn't have a personal workspace. There was far less space dedicated to collaboration. I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but every time I was meeting with a tenant, you know, over the past couple of years, the same kind of concerns or challenges came up. We have a giant boardroom and it sits 50 people, but we use it maybe once a quarter or once a year. And actually teams of two, five or 10 people are reserving this giant boardroom. And we're seeing that there's a need for much more team spaces to collaborate in smaller groups. Um, so moving forward, we are anticipating and we're seeing in some of those early conversations around what the workplace design will start to evolve into, um, taking into consideration the value proposition of the office you can see here, we're anticipating much greater focus placed on collaboration spaces, um, an increased focus on amenities as we think about health and well being and work life balance. And I'll share with you what some of those might look like. There's still going to be a value and a place for individual workspaces. And in the hybrid format, um, you know, you're, you're potentially looking at a scenario where people who come in three days per week get a dedicated desk, and those who come in two, or one day per week um, have a hoteling station. And then opportunities for social and learning, and this is really kind of community space um, to get together in the office or have an after you know, work hours, social party or gathering. So thinking about what employees would like to have access to in their workspace or their workplace or location, um, we found that health and well-being services are really important. And that, that was true leading up to the pandemic again, um, but thinking about um, fitness, and that could be a variety of different options. Um, food services are important, and we've actually seen great innovations with um, restaurants and fast casual restaurants over the course of this pandemic by way of them, you know, really trying to remain operable, but um, being able to order online, um, having something healthy and quick nearby, um, health services, having access to um, outpatient care services, or life is easy services, you know, being able to, to pick up a prescription at a, a drugstore, you know, all of these things are coming together to really enhance the um, health and well being and the work life balance of employees, which again was something that I think everybody recognized leading up to this. Um, and now we have you know, much more data as it relates to what are those amenities and, and what really enables health and well-being. And you can see these are the nine foundations of a healthy building um, from the, the Harvard Health School, um, which I think is, you know, it makes a lot of sense although we didn't put as much focus on air quality and ventilation that we're now recognizing is essential. And in fact, in studies, the quality of the air can really enhance productivity of employees um, and the loss of productivity when the work environment has lesser access to public, uh, uh, natural light or to good air quality or biophilia can be as much as a 25 to, I believe, $120 billion productivity impact. So not only is there a good reason for the health and well-being of employees, but there's a good reason for um, focusing on this, you know, for the bottom line. So Julia, let's go back to that slide. We're getting a lot of questions on it. Yes. Um, so the first question I'm going to put two together, I'm paraphrasing. So one is, do we think amenity space will become less important since people will be working from home or more and uh, need amenities less? And then the second question that kind of goes with this, will the amenity space be common um, in the building or will they be within the tenant space? Uh, you know, do we have any idea on what the trend is there? 
Yes, two great questions. Um, so a couple of things. I think what's been challenging over the course of the past 12 months is that we're living through a crisis and um, it's kind of like going on a, a crash diet, right? We, <laughs> When you only live on water and celery, um, it's hard to sustain and at some point you kind of snap back. We economists are, are anticipating that consumer spending, um, travel, leisure, entertainment will bounce back over the summer because there's pent up demand. Um, we anticipate that there's also pent up demand to come back together as a, a company. Um, and as you saw from the reentry timeline, we do anticipate that there will be increased work from home, but it won't be so widespread that people won't still need access to the amenities and services that really enable better work-life balance. What's interesting though, is that we're starting to see, you know, a, a greater focus on amenities that kind of mimic your maybe work from home experience. Um, so pro buildings are thinking about programming farmers markets. Um, food trucks had already been really popular leading up to this. Um, outdoor space, everybody's been able to enjoy probably hopefully more outdoor time taking phone calls on walks. Um, so the amenities package will um, continue to evolve for owners and landlords, you know, really thinking about how do we enable um, and create a, a vibrant experience when they come to our building or our neighborhood. Um, some of the amenities in the office space are going to be more around those collaboration spaces. If you are coming into the office exclusively to partner with people and collaborate, you know, that will be considered an amenity. You have access to great tools and technology and you have access to great space to really be highly productive versus what may be challenging for some is trying to, to create that same spark of innovation and creativity over a Zoom call or a, a, a Teams chat. So and it's gonna be a one more call. Thanks, Julia. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. The one follow-up question is just, what is included in sports services? Is that the gym or is there something else, an amenity that we're not aware of? Sorry, what, what, what services? Sports services. Oh, sports services. Um, yes. So there are kind of two different ways to look at this. Um, so well-being services can be things like um, having access to quiet space, meditation rooms, mother's rooms, um, nap pods. Sports services can be um, attributed to more of the um, kind of fitness amenities that would be available. And, and really starting to think a little bit more broadly beyond the the um, gym, you know, the traditional gym, which is great, and and many people still want that as an amenity. But also thinking about um, maybe a yoga room, or um, even thinking about virtual uh, fitness amenities like the Mirror or um, Peloton, which is actually becoming more popular in multifamily. But we can see that becoming an amenity in office space and office buildings as well. Thank you. Um, so, you know, thinking about the, the building attributes, we've talked about a lot of this, so I won't spend um, too much time, but a couple of areas that have really emerged recently, um, not just as the course of the pandemic, but uh, over the past couple of years, well building certification has really emerged as being um, highly desirable because of the um, quality of the space uh, that ties to the ventilation, the filtration and the purification of your um, your indoor air quality, the outdoor spaces, as I mentioned, um, touchless technologies. You know, I think <laughs> it was only a matter of time. Um, and, you know, I think we can all agree that over the course of cold and flu seasons, everybody became a little bit less um, willing to, to grab doorknobs and were a little bit more careful. Operable windows. Um, this had emerged actually at the end of the last recession 
really being a huge value add for tenants to be able to open their windows and access natural air um, through those on-demand services and amenities that buildings offer to be able to make appointments or to order food. Um, video conferencing spaces, if you don't put that into your workspace, having it available as amenity within the building. Biophilic design, bringing plants inside green walls have become really popular. And um, when you talk to people who have access or work near a green wall, they'll, they'll say that their energy levels have increased significantly. Bike storage, um, again, a trend that we had already seen over the past 10 years, including end of trip services. So bike storage lockers and showers and, and um, personal lockers for clothing and, and other items. Um, high parking ratios. This one is, I think, one we'll have to watch for because we have noted that people have expressed a concern around using public transportation. Um, but we do anticipate long term that people will go back to public transportation. It, it creates, I am a lifelong public transit user and it creates a huge advantage for me in my workday for a variety of different reasons. So long term, we do believe in the value of it. Um, but recognize, you know, over the course of the next 12 months, it, it's still a health concern for people being really close to others. Um, you know, enhanced janitorial, quasi-private amenity spaces. So you're not necessarily sharing them all with the public, but maybe they're private to the building. Um, more flexible lease terms and, um, you know, higher tenant improvement allowance packages to really retrofit the space to de-densify or to add the amenities that you need to be successful. And then lastly, and, and then we'll open it up for questions um, that we haven't already tackled. You know, I, I mentioned the purpose of an office for employees and really focusing on collaboration and socialization and the ability to bring people together. I heard um, one corporate occupier use the term uh, gather then scatter. We want to make our workplace a place where they can come together and gather and then they can scatter to wherever they're going to do their heads down work. Um, so, you know, thinking about how the physical office serves business purposes, uh, not just personal services. Um, it's really about protecting the brand image. A lot of corporations really develop a brand around what their environment is like and how can they enable their culture and how can they enable innovation through a workplace that shows what kind of a company they are. Um, this also plays into talent attraction and retention. The, the impression that an employee or potential employee gains when coming into the physical location and seeing this is what my, my 40 hour work week could look like goes a long way. Uh, there's also great value in protecting the intellectual capital of a company, uh, depending on what type of, of service you provide, if it's prototypes or if it's files even, and making sure everything is safe and secure. Again, you know, having a place to socialize and then also creating a place where people can create work-life boundaries for themselves. I was talking to a, a analyst on my team um, in a different market and she was saying, I can't wait to get back into the office because when I'm riding home on the train and somebody calls me, I can say, actually, I'm, I'm on my personal time and I'm riding the train, so I'll get back to you later. That people are really craving that separation of work and life, which has been hard to achieve as we've been working from home. So there is still a great value of having a physical workplace. Uh, it's just a matter of getting through the crisis and making sure that people are really taken care of from their health and well being and personal needs. So that's what I have for you today. Um, I'm happy to take any other questions that you have. All right, Julia, we have a few coming in. So um, from a culture perspective, have we received any feedback from companies on the concept of having new hires work from the office for a minimum of one to two years to understand corporate culture before being allowed more flexible work arrangements? 
Yes, um, that's a good question. You may have seen in, in the media, Facebook came out saying that over the course of the next 10 years, they would um, allow the shift to, I think up to 50% of their workforce to work from home. But when you break it down, it was for more senior level roles. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of value of getting people into a workplace to, to learn and grow and develop. Um, in talking with a couple of startups recently, smaller teams um, who have received funding recently and need to grow their headcount, you know, two or three times the size of what they are today. The, the biggest concern they have is we need a, a workspace, we need a place where we can develop that culture and where people can eventually come together and see what we're all about as a company and make those personal connections. And they're very concerned in this remote environment that that's going to be a little bit delayed um, as they scale up because people are working from home. So, you know, as you think, as we think, and, and we've seen in past recessions that a lot of innovation comes out of crisis and we anticipate that there will be continued innovation, especially in New England. We've seen a lot of um, life sciences growth over the course of the past year and over the course of the past five years, you know, having a, a workplace to bring people together and grow a business is really critical. Thank you. And then another question, uh, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but do we have any data on the age demographic um, in the remote work model? Um, you know what, that, that is a good question. Anecdotally, I can tell you that um, we've seen from some early surveys that it's been harder for younger people, um, you know, in the work from home environment. Some of that has to do with the fact that they're just not set up to work productively from home. I was chatting with a, a young analyst um, within our company and he was saying, I don't have anywhere to sit at home. I can sit at my couch, but I stand at my kitchen counter all day long. I need to get back into the office because I have a more comfortable chair and I have a desk and you know, my studio just doesn't support me. Um, and, and that is true for a few people that I've spoken with and they've been in the office since it reopened every single day because that's where they can do their best work. Um, I have heard a term called generational uh, vacancy from the legal services sector where older law firm partners are actually well equipped to work from home and they have their book of business. So it's a matter of um, managing their business versus younger partners or associates who are really in business development mode or need access to the law library or the files in the office that that find that that is a greater need for them. Okay, this one, I really like this question. It's about surveying your employees. So how often is too often to survey them? And how often do you suggest um, surveying, surveying to see the changes? Because I, I love that the, the data showed us people felt very differently about working from home 12 months ago than they do today. So what's the right cadence for that? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, you know, it's interesting in March, those first two weeks of March when everybody was working from home, it was all about getting yourself set up to work from home effectively. In April, we started having conversations with our tenant clients about the tactical needs that they needed to be focused on to get people back into the office because we were anticipating um, you know, May or June reentry, which quickly we realized that with school closures and the progression of the pandemic was not, um, it just wasn't realistic, you know, so those early surveys that people conducted, I think were good to understand um, concerns and fears and challenges that people may be facing with kids at home or other um, family caregiver situations. As as we got through the summer and uh, the realization around schools became real for everybody, um, that's when we started to see corporates announce more conservative reentry timelines to accommodate those needs. And some of the biggest corporate occupiers, you know, first came out and said, we'll, we'll be back in the office by the end of 2020. They pushed that out to the middle of 2021. And, and a few have recently said, we'll be back in the fall of of 2021 or even the end of the year just to accommodate all of that. So it has been a little bit of a, a moving target. As it relates to 
the cadence for which you could think about serving employees, the way that we've really started to frame it out is now that we have a lot of great data and learnings, and there are three models, if you will, for workplace uh, structure, there's in office, there's hybrid, and there's remote. Once you decide what does your business need, if you take into consideration everything you see on this slide, what does your business need? Um, what do your people need? And what are your business objectives for either maintaining the business or growing it? And then which workplace strategy plugs into that? And how does the culture play a role? And once you've kind of identified what the needs are, then you can start to conduct surveys of, okay, if we're gonna be hybrid, who would like to be in office? Who would like to be a remote? How do we start to structure schedules that way? And then once we understand what the, the headcount needs look like, then we can start thinking about the real estate. Um, but you know, as the course of this pandemic rolls out, I think there are probably gonna be the need for a couple of surveys, maybe once a quarter to gauge you know, the situation, um, but not necessarily. I think it can be challenging if you start to provide a lot of different options to consider before understanding what the pandemic will look like or the vaccine rollout. Um, so it's really about understanding what are your business needs and what are your employee needs and then starting to do a decision tree, you know, in different directions based on that. All right. And so here is our final question. Um, so as people are working from home, are you starting to see them ask for um, stipends for heating and cooling their home or better internet service or IT specifically? Uh, and are companies, you know, offering that up? What does that look like and what are we seeing with our clients? Yes, again, this I think is, um, we'll start to see some new trends evolve over the next six months. And it's a variety from what we've seen so far. Um, there are some companies that are offering stipends and they'll come in and they'll set up your whole home office. There are some companies that will offer stipends so you can purchase the equipment that you need to be more productive at home. And you know, if there's a, if the, if there are companies that are deciding, you know, we really do our best work in person, um, there may not be any type of allowance. As far as paying for heating and cooling bills, um, I have not heard that come up. Certainly, internet and phone um, have have been kind of the two predominant um, cost considerations as people work from home. And we may have some new learnings that say, you know, people are spending a considerable amount of additional energy costs being at home all day. I think the one kind of counterpoint to that is that a lot of people have noted they're saving a lot of money by not commuting, um, by not needing to buy, you know, new work clothes every month or how, however often people shop. Um, so there are probably some trade-offs uh, but that, that one's an interesting one. I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that. Well, thank you, Julia. We really appreciate you coming and uh, providing your thought leadership on the future of work. I'm hoping when we get back to work, we can have you to come back and do a 2.0. Um, what's the new normal and what does it look like? Uh, and for everybody who's here today, there will be a survey coming out after um, we hang up the call. So please fill it out. We uh, use it for data points for upcoming Crave sessions. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thank you, everybody.